honestly, I really just want to make people's lives better. I'm generally a very curious and open-minded person, and I have a passion for kind of just making others feel heard and, and seen and making sure everyone's voices are heard. Being able to educate more people in like my community, at least, because I know there's so many people out there on the internet, there's already so many things um, that p other people, other organizations have collected and put out there. Um, but I want to see if we as like a group can put something together that contributes to that, contributes to our own community specifically, and is able to make some sort of change to fix the problems that we're looking at. Don't accept no. Like in your careers, wherever that path takes you, just don't accept, accept no, the first no. Because if you're going to be an agent of change, you're going to get it a lot. You're going to get it a lot. I'm at a point in which um, who you are is so much more important than what you have done. And, and I think I love being introduced as someone who first and foremost, a force for good in my every, everyday life and not just a list of accomplishments that at the end of the day are not as important. Being a teenager in this day and age, I feel as if many people don't take you seriously. The Teen Think Tank project has actually given me the voice I needed. By talking to other people around the country who have the same passions as me and allowing me to actually do something about the societal issues and actually trying to solve them, it just opened my eyes to what at we as teenagers can do to actually help solve these problems. Yes. Welcome to the Teen Think Tank Project. This is where exceptional teens come to solve problems. My name is Matt DeSantis. I'm here with my Teen Think Tank Project co-founder. Kelly Nagel, and the Summer Research Cohort. As an organization that is poised to elevate teen voices, there is only one thing you do not want to hear, and that is my voice. So I will hand these entire proceedings over to the stars of tonight's show. The Teen Think Tank Project, Financial Stability Cohort, and their Summer Research Project Policy Launch Party. Without further ado, Pranav, take it away. Thank you, Matt. Hey everyone, welcome to the annual Teen Think Tank Project launch party. We appreciate all of you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today to discuss about a matter that many people in America suffer with, financial stability. Before we begin, just a brief introduction about what the Teen Think Tank Project is. The Teen Think Tank Project strives to give teens a platform in which their voices can be heard. In society today, what we find is that many people do not take teens seriously. However, this program gives teens the opportunity to take that step and actually create change. Well, that's enough of introducing. So without further ado, I'm gonna give it off to Leah, my, uh, my peer, to jumpstart this launch party. Hey guys, I'm Leah, and I just wanted to um, give a brief introduction before we actually start. So approximately 45 million people in the US live in poverty. Roughly, that's about 13.7% of all Americans. To most of America, this may not seem like a lot, and that's exactly the problem. Now, meet 11 socially conscious individuals who strive not only to inspire change, but implement it within our society and make everyone around us as socially conscious as we are. Hi everyone, my name is Jada and I'm a senior from McDonough, Georgia. These past few months, I've had the amazing opportunity of being a participant in the Teen Think Tank. I've been able to learn so much about financial instability, as well as a combination of personal and professional skills. I can't wait to share this knowledge with students at my school, as well as members of my community. 
Hi, I'm Fiona Shanahan from Moore, New Jersey, and I'm a rising junior. I wanted to join this project to find people who are as passionate as me about making change and collaborate with them. I'm so excited to see how this project can help me become an agent of change in my own community. Hey guys, I'm Leah and I'm a 2024 graduate. So one thing that hooked me in right from the beginning was the idea of influencing. Those who inspire change truly strive to make a difference, whether it be through a small community or a vast audience. I joined the Teen Think Tank project to do just that, to solve real problems with people with the same real ideas as I do. I wanted to actually implement change rather than observe from the bubbles that I'm used to. I've learned so much about real world problems, problems that are often sugar-coated from my amazing mentors and fellow cohort members that I've gained from the project. Hi everyone, my name is Tanapa Trevu and I'm a rising junior in Somerset County Vocational Technical High School. And the reason why I decided to join the Teen Think Tank project was because being a teenager in this day and age, I feel as if many people don't take you seriously. The Teen Think Tank project has actually given me the voice I needed. Um, by talking to other people around the country who have the same passions as me and allowing me to actually do something about the societal issues and actually trying to solve them. Hello, my name is Melon Patel and I live in Franklin Township, New Jersey. I am a rising junior and the reason I joined this team was not just to witness the change but be part of the change. I also wanted to talk about a topic not many people are familiar with which is financial stability and create a network with peers that will last me a lifetime with people who have similar goals as me. Hi, my name is Indiana and I joined this cohort because I was interested in partaking in and seeing change in action. I was also interested in discussing and gaining new information about real life issues. Hello everyone, my name is Samir. I'm a rising senior as well as an agent of change. I aspire to create change so that individuals who are unable to get their voice heard have a platform to utilize in order to get their needs met. I joined the Teen Think Tank project to meet other individuals who are passionate about the same issues as me, as well as to grow my network and meet people who could help to aspire change through the collaboration of ideas. After all, we are the next generation that is going to inherit the world and it is our responsibility as a cohort and society to make sure that people are educated on issues so that we can build the future. Okay, now I'm gonna be introducing our impediments. Uh, so we decided as a cohort to split our task of helping America escape the grip poverty has in society by splitting up into groups of four to disseminate between economic, legal, and societal impediments. We would then go on to study and analyze particular texts in order to gain more knowledge on each specific impediment. Now I'll pass it over to our first. Poverty is an ongoing and intricate issue that requires balancing three different powers, one of which is the economic standpoint. For one, lack of stable housing can present a whole new deal of issues such as mental, mental instability, physical disability, lack of education, and much more. Financial stability is something that is highly sought after, but not everyone is able to attain stability with their monetary interests. One of the primary issues is that in order to address these problems, we must be able to comprehend them. One of the economic theories that we learned about as part of our research included the rule of 72. For those of you who are unaware of this rule, it is a formula that describes how poverty is compounding and continuously worsens as it flows through generations. One of the statistics we studied was that most families should allocate about 30% of their earnings on rent. Meanwhile, people in poverty are allocating roughly 60% of their earnings, which is nearly double the amount as the norm. This makes it excruciatingly hard to progress and overcome that constant cycle of poverty. Present day, the impact of the pandemic only served to worsen poverty and homelessness within the country. Economic downturn has made a significant impact on this problem as it increased the number of financially unstable individuals. People are applying for vouchers under the Section 8 housing program. However, landlords are unwilling to rent to voucher holders due to, due to the adverse impact on the economy. This worsens the inconsistencies associated with housing or lack thereof. Problem lies in the fact that most of society isn't educated enough to be able to change these imperfections. With that in mind, I'll pass it off to our next impediment, the Societal Impediments Group. Believe it or not, society has its own impact on poverty, just as or maybe even more important than the economic and legal counterparts. Due to societal norms, we must reshape the prior biases that our society has about financial stability. This can come in the form of educating and guiding the public with reliable and informative resources. By providing different means 
of education, we can break down the barriers within the minds of our society. We can supply our youth with reliable information that will give them an accurate representation of financial instability and how it may impact the people around them. As a community, we have to work together to support people who are not financially stable and must recognize the possible struggles that are keeping them from escaping the system that's keeping them in poverty. By guiding and providing support, we can lessen the impacts of these societal impediments. Now my peer Jada will be discussing the legal impediments leading to financial instability. Thank you, Fiona. Now, unsurprisingly, when it comes to American poverty, there are a lot of barriers that impoverished families have to overcome. When we first started breaking down this impediment, we honed in on the absence of representation in landlord-tenant court. Specifically, we examined the Gideon v. Wainwright Supreme Court case, which resulted in a mandatory representation for any criminal case. However, the same right was not awarded to individuals in courts outside of the criminal realm. Therefore, we looked at the negative impact that the absence of rep representation had on tenants who cannot adequately speak for themselves in court. From there, we looked at current legislation, specifically the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which was put in place as an attempt to destroy the decades of systemic racism in the housing system. One of the quotes that we used from Matthew Desmond that perfectly describes the Fair Housing Act and other legislation that attempted to create an equal housing sector is equal treatment in an unequal society can still foster inequality. Lastly, we investigated the role that federal programs have in keeping individuals financially unstable. In particular, we looked at social security income, which is meant to provide income to disabled adults, whether that is mentally or physically. We concluded that the program was very counterintuitive as it often causes dependence and based on the threshold used to determine eligibility, it discourages saving to ensure that there's always a limited amount of money in an, in an individual's bank account. By sifting through all three impediments and participating in an extensive amount of research, we are finally able to find a common problem. But before we reveal the basis of the rest of our research, I would like to throw it to Stray to talk a little bit about our guest speakers throughout this process. Our, feature spe uh, our featured speakers uh, throughout this uh, call tonight will be Mary Pascarella, Donna Gallup, and Mizozu Houston. Our guest instructors throughout this program who've helped us are Ms. Connie Whitman and Bruce Waltuck, and our contributors are Ashika Gopalkrishnan and Dr. Catalina Rojas. Hello, I'm Indiana, and uh, Jada, Solomon, and I make up the writing team for our co cohort's policy paper. So the first step in creating our policy paper was, of course, research. We wanted to include everybody in the production process in one way or another. So as a group, we discussed our desired focus of the paper and came up with four research questions. Those being, one, what is the best way to reach people? Two, what kind of legal changes or policies do we think should be instated? Three, what are the hidden elements of poverty and housing instability that people may not know about? And four, what social change how would social change lead to legislative or economic change? After completing this research as a team, Jada, Solomon, and I moved on to our paper. So thanks to one of our experts, Professor Donna Gallup, um, and our team's research, we decided to focus on addressing poverty through the lens of housing instability. This is because, as we discussed in our paper, without stable and secure housing, individuals don't have the financial, emotional, or mental resources to focus on the other elements of poverty that they may be facing. They also lack the community safety nets and networks that people rely on to succeed. Once we decided on the focus of our policies, we found a large roadblock. Unfortunately, there isn't a public understanding of poverty, housing instability, and policy solutions. Uh, we found that this lack of understanding has a lot of negative consequences, both in instating our policies and adds a tremendous extra load to the struggles of uh, impoverished individuals. This idea was a large part of our paper. So in addressing housing instability, we found two main solutions. One was enacting policies that make evictions more fair or limit, amount, limit the amount of needless evictions, which benefits both the tenants and the landlords. And two, creating more affordable housing and housing programs. I focused on the former, addressing legal issues like the lack of representation in landlord tenant court that severely uh, skews the amount of tenants who are unjustly evicted, I also address societal issues like the racial gap in evictions caused by 
generations of oppressive and discriminatory legislation and business practices, some of which are still in place today, and problematic policies like nuisance ordinances. Um, so these ordinances punish landlords for housing tenants that call emergency services uh, excessively, even for warranted cases like reporting domestic violence or stalking. This often leads to the eviction of the difficult tenant. Um, one statistic that we found was um, in 83% of the circumstances where individuals called the police for domestic violence and received a nuisance ordinance, they were evicted. So a lot of individuals are placed in the situation of do I face this domestic, domestic violence or do I end up on the street? Um, and addressing these issues would result in a reduced amount of evictions and therefore give more people the chance to improve their living situations. Now I'll pass it over to Jada to discuss the other aspects of our housing instability policies. Thank you, Indiana. So as a part of our policy paper and our mission to provoke public awareness, we decided to research and include four affordable housing programs that are currently available and how they can help in the mission to bring about affordable housing if they were brought to scale and more efficient. One method that has been used to address the affordable housing crisis includes the institution of permanent supportive, permanent supportive housing programs, also known as BSH. PSH projects work to provide stable housing to chronically homeless and disabled families through subsidization and individualized services. The accessibility of PSH programs is emphasized through their low entry barriers, which are especially important for communities who are disproportionately impacted by incarceration and eviction. However, due to the inability to bring PSH projects to scale because of conflicting regulations, lack of funding and public ignorance, these achievements may seem small as a large part of the vulnerable population continues to receive no federal assistance. Next is rapid rehousing, also known as RRH, which is focused on limiting the amount of time an individual spends homeless. Created through the Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program, RRH acts to quickly connect vulnerable families or individuals to permanent housing units through financial assistance and individualized services, similar to PSH. Unfortunately, despite its success, RRH remains largely unused as a form of housing assistance among low-income families. Additionally, due to its temporary nature, it does not necessarily address food and job insecurity, which is known as a struggle point for a majority of impoverished families. Unlike the options mentioned before, public housing, one of the most known, known affordable housing mechanisms for low-income families and individuals, is an approach used to directly rent to low-income and disabled tenants at low prices. Public housing can be seen as a direct solution to the lack of affordable housing as rent burdened families are provided with more affordable options. Yet public housing has also had a derogatory impact, especially on communities of color. Instead of providing stability and security, public housing has become synonymous with violence, crime, and most notably concentrated poverty. Lastly is a housing voucher is a housing choice voucher program which is commonly referred to as Section 8. Housing vouchers are the largest federally backed housing subsidy for low income and disabled families. It serves to provide safe and sanitary housing assistance to families within the private market. However, there are several shortcomings to this type of housing subsidy. This includes the prevalence of tenant discrimination by landlords through vouchers, which Samir briefly mentioned, and voucher exploitation. Each housing option discussed has provided a form of assistance to burdened families and individuals. However, the limitations are apparent and amid a pandemic, the impact cannot be any more severe. The first step towards providing families with adequate housing is building public awareness around this issue to topple negative systemic housing practices, create effective legislation, and finally begin to elevate the vulnerable low income class. Now, to talk about the last section of our policy paper, I would like to give it to Salma. Thank you, Jada. Um, so for our um, section about um, how social change um, can stimulate uh, legislative um, and economic change, um, we really emphasize the idea that um, that breaking societal norms and um, 
really through through widespread outreach and awareness is is definitely one of the keys to um, towards changing the system um, by really dismantling um, attitudes kind of fixed in a w such a way that that impedes progress um, and so and we really emphasized how um, how this requires political mobilization in a way that that really combats um, ignorance and and um, and promotes education and um, and kind of combats these ideologies that really just are a product of of misguided understanding and, and prejudice and and mere ignorance. Um, and so, so, but this kind of political mobilization really requires a shift in vision. Um, and so uh, really upsetting the status quo and, and spreading um, more awareness and, and, and really um, and, and mass resistance against these harmful societal norms um, and notions is, is really gonna make real impact. Um, but it's obviously only possible when, when groups of people believe that they have the collective capacity to, to affect change. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the ideas that, that that we really focused on in this in this section was um, the idea of of learned helplessness and how how um, many people who are on the brink of eviction are kind of caught in this cycle uh, this vicious cycle of of um, kind of being stuck um, and feeling as though they have no control over their actions and everything is. Um, their circumstances are outside of, the, outside of their control because they're being victimized by, by the system. And, um, and so really spreading awareness about um, the, the flaws within the system and the inequities um, uh, can really help break that cycle. Um, and so that's really what, um, what we, we focused on. Okay, hey, so our team was thinking of ideas on creating change when we stumbled across one that won't just spread awareness, but garner a community of change makers. That idea indeed was a nonprofit organization. Obviously with a nonprofit, the central idea is to make money to help people in need. So we are creating our own line of merchandise and donating the proceeds to help people with financial difficulties. Right now, we can design our clothes on Teespring or Canvas, two websites for those who are unfamiliar. Then we can get them printed after finding a manufacturer and then ship them out to customers. We will donate that money to other more known nonprofit organizations or charities, such as UNICEF. We are hoping to get our nonprofit to become a 501c3. In addition, we hope to partner with parent nonprofits who have the same goal as us, and we can feature each other's merchandise on our websites. We also want to promote our nonprofit through influencers who can wear our merchandise in their videos and help spread the message. Influence marketing is on the rise and there's no better time to start a nonprofit than right now. Furthermore, our team's whole purpose is to transfer the skills we have learned during our time together into the real world to solve significant crises. In an abundance of situations, people talk about change but don't directly help. Let's face it, there's a reason teen think tanks are being created. Essentially, we want to be advocates of change, help break the cycle, and we can achieve this by directly helping people affected by financial instability. One way we thought of doing that was through this nonprofit organization. On our website, we will also feature scholarly articles and have a newsletter sent out to help spread the message and create a community of people who will fight a topic not many people are familiar with. So uh, on the next two slides, we have some designs we uh, 
we created, but we hope to expand our apparel to bigger and brighter ideas. Now I will hand it off for the Q&A. Millen, thank you very much. While I promised uh, that I was not going to come back, somebody had to transition the Q&A, and that happens to be me. Um, first, I just want to take uh, a breather. I want to let everyone take a chance, uh, take a moment to applaud uh, this research cohort, um, applaud these young women and men um, who have spent the last 12 weeks of their entire summer engaging in academic discourse. You folks thought you were going to come to a high school presentation that didn't mention Gideon V. Wainwright. Well, the joke's on you. This is the second time I've heard teenagers today reference the Supreme Court case, Gideon V. Wainwright. And for a former recovering law school graduate, uh, it does my heart and brain good to know that there are uh, students out there like this cohort who are dedicating themselves to uh, fact-based dialogue and actual research. So I think the best way to transition from that presentation to meaningful dialogue is to ask these individuals, ask these students, ask these colleagues what's on their mind. And to help me do that will be my Teen Think Tank project uh, colleague and friend, Kelly Nagel. Good evening, everyone. Appreciate everyone being here. Team, amazing job. I tell you this every time I get the opportunity to be with you all. And every time I leave you at the end of our calls, I am not only inspired, but just awestruck at the capacity that you have to expand your perspectives and think critically and really give Matt and I and, and all the adults on the call a, a different way of looking at these issues, but B, I, I think a lot of hope in, in the future when um, sometimes hope is in short supply. And if you are anybody like me, uh, I watch way too much news coverage um, and uh, hope is in short supply on a, on a lot of the, the major media networks. So um, thank you for always restoring my faith. Um, I, before we open up questions to the audience, as I'm sure you all have a million questions now that these students have helped expand our perspectives and our understandings of financial stability, uh, I'm going to throw out a couple questions to our team uh, that have already come in. Um, and Millen, I am going to start with you, my friend. First question for you is, how do you feel now that you are a professional academic content creator? And a content creator, for those um, who are not familiar, our students are developing research and their opinions and information that they want to convey in different mediums, whether it's blogs or social media or podcasts. So Milan, now that you're official academic uh, content creator, how do you see it's either similar or different uh, to creating social media content for an entertainment purpose? Um, honestly, I think it is very similar in the way that both, like what the style we presented in today was great to people who are really interested in this sort of stuff. But then there's also a lot of people who just want short clips of what is happening and that's really good where that's where social media really comes in where people just want to get to the point straight away here it's more about the point the solution what we've been working on which is all great stuff and it feels really good to be a professional in this uh sort of content created creator field because i learned so much just being here 
I learned how to actually write a policy maker, policy paper, how to do research, how to well, like help start up a nonprofit organization, just all these great things. Amazing, thank you. Uh, Fiona, I'm gonna toss you the next question. Upon entering the Teen Think Tank project, there was an expectation of personal development and societal growth. And our program focuses a great deal on professional development. So can you share how you felt you benefited from that element? Yeah, for sure. So during this project, I was able to develop professionally while also developing in many other aspects, like learning how to research in the correct manner, like Millen mentioned, learning how to structure a policy paper, becoming more comfortable just discussing my opinions in a group setting and truly letting my voice be heard. And I was able to learn and understand the way I work best in this team setting. And I also where, learned where I may need to improve in the future. And I believe that through this whole project, I've become an agent of change and I'm excited to now implement change into my own community. Excellent. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, Samir, jumping over to you, my friend. Uh, your primary interest and future career pursuits were not actually focused on financial stability, rather you were interested in healthcare and access to care. Were there any skills or experience that you were able to take, that you will be able to take with you from your work in this particular research cohort? Yeah, uh, definitely. So part of being an agent of change to me means you're able to stay disciplined, staying open to listening to others and in order to communicate and being able to specifically voice the concerns of your fellow team members. So in the medical field, I plan to apply many of my learnings from the Teen Think Tank project. As an agent of change, I plan to amplify my learnings from medical research and leadership from the research work I did under the Teen Think Tank project to keep from engaging in emerging sciences to help influence some of the medical administrative processes and serve others with a renewed sense of purpose. Great, thanks, Samir. Uh, Jada and Pranav, I have two questions for you, or excuse me, I have one question for the both of you. Um, Jada, if you uh, would be kind enough to answer first. Um, at the beginning of the cohort, you were asked to identify an area that you would like to improve upon either personally or academically. Uh, what is that skill, and did you achieve your goal? So if I remember correctly, that skill was my inability to communicate confidently. I had a really time, you know, trying to get my ideas across. I remember our first meeting, I was actually paired with Fiona to find out. We were finding out a little bit more about each other, and we were just talking, and we were like, oh my gosh, like, we're so nervous, like, and we were communication was a big thing for each of us. So as we progressed through the program and I saw each one of you guys just talk so confidently and be able to convey your perspective across really inspired me and helped me kind of develop the skill. And now I'm here today talking about a presentation on financial instability. So I think the growth is really apparent. Excellent. And Jada, I, I would agree. Pranav, how about you, my friend? Yeah, so mine's kind of similar to Jada. I think before I came in, I think that's what I put on the sheet. Um, I lacked in confidence, right? I was scared on saying my point of view on like a political thing or on anything, perhaps. Like just, I'm more of like a people pleaser. So like, I'll kind of just like go with the flow, say like agree with what other people are saying. But I feel like by joining this cohort, I finally was able to kind of voice my own opinion out there, right? Even if it was different compared to others, I still was standing by my own opinion. And I felt like without this, I probably wouldn't be able to grab that skill. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. We're happy to have you in and agree. Uh, tremendous growth among all of you um, in, in a lot of different skills. Um, so bravo to, to all of you for challenging yourself and, and stepping a little bit out of your comfort zone. It has paid dividends. Um, I'm gonna throw this question out to, to anyone who would like to answer. Um, question coming from the audience that you all mentioned that education and awareness are key ways to make change. So how will you educate others and spread awareness about financial instability? 
And are there specific topics or pieces of information you will focus on first? Uh, Fiona, it's all your hand. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, but just one aspect that I was thinking about recently of implementing into the school system as possibly um, as like um, a reading for the whole school to do, it, having a book like Eviction, like we read by Matthew Desmond, having a whole school read that and read about those experiences that we got to hear firsthand from. I thought that would be definitely a way to educate the public and also other teenagers about a subject with those um, point of views. And then if anybody else wants to add on, go ahead. Yeah, I think that um, for the specific topics or pieces of information that you would focus on, I think you really address that well, because I would agree. I think the first thing that you would need to focus on are the issues that people face when trying to get themselves out of poverty. I think that the policies and solutions that we have, those are very important for the public to know, but I think until they address the problem and they see it face level, um, we can't move on to that step. Great. Anyone else want to jump in and share their response? I kind of wanted to back off of Fiona about what she said about the school uh, school ideas. I was also thinking maybe clubs, we could um, incorporate clubs in most of the school, have people sort of interact more closely with the idea of financial instability. And also um, to kind of also back off of Fiona, the book itself, uh, the one that we read was Eviction by Matthew Desmond. We could also incorporate that in the clubs. Excellent. I'll pause for a second. Anybody else? Uh, any of the other research associates care to jump in? Okay, next question. Interesting one. Do you feel political views play a role in tackling this problem? I can answer that one. Perfect. Um, I think not really, not as much as political views, but really when you look at corporate interests, corporate interests, you know, when you see a lot of lobbyists and they come up, do you have them introduce the idea of affordable housing? they're not necessarily going to be happy with something like that because, you know, they're in the real estate sector. They make money in the private market. So they're going to lobby against things like affordable housing and public housing, which makes it harder to get this legislation passed and people into affordable homes. So I think corporate interest really has a big impact. You know, corporate interests can intertwine with political views. Great perspective. Other thoughts, responses to that? Okay, we have another one. Uh, what was your biggest quote, aha moment? Either something that was a pleasant surprise or where you grew as an individual or something that you learned in a way that you didn't anticipate. I think I can answer that one as well. Perfect. So towards the beginning of the cohort, when we started, we went through this um, series of quizzes. I guess you could call them quizzes, but they were more like analysis where we um, delved into our personal, like our personal strengths, personal weaknesses, and kind of categorized them. So I originally, I had voices to Matt. I had originally um, been a little not sure, unsure about the whole idea of that because I find myself to put what I want versus what I am. And I think with that, it made me a lot more, like you said, aha, oh wait, I can actually put stuff into the categories that I want and I can see where my strengths are. And I think that really, that really helped shape the path that we went towards, especially regarding research, putting ourselves into groups and talking about certain topics, it really, it really helped. Amazing. Thank you, Leah. Other research associates? Put your newfound communication skills to, to good use. Okay. 
Okay, we have two more questions I will throw out there. Uh, the value of the teen think tank project to the panelists is evident as we see each of you express your personal growth. How do you see the value of the program to our society and how do you think that value can be attained? I, I can answer this. Excellent, Nolan. Um, so like it obvious, this, this program has a really good value because it's creating like this young generation, it's what's gonna be leading the world and it's gonna happen before you know it. So we really need to be in touch with problems that not many people talk about because we might not see it, but then it'll have a huge effect later on. So one of those topics is coincidentally financial instability. So these sort of teen think tanks being created are really giving voices to young teenagers who don't really have the ability to have their opinions expressed because most adults just think, oh, we're kids. We don't know what we're doing. But in this place, we have a safe environment to talk. Excellent. Thank you, Millen. Last question is from a, one of our Teen Think Tank Project alums, Jared Cannon. Thank you for joining us, my friend. Uh, if you don't know Jared, he was part of our winter research cohort studying racial inequality in sports and society, uh, and really appreciate your support of the team joining us tonight. So Jared's question is, how do you feel the work you did as a cohort will benefit others? And do you think your work will help the rest of society learn about poverty and work to end it? Uh, I think I can take that question. Awesome, Shai. So the work that we've like done in this cohort will definitely help uh, future research and future uh, understanding about financial impediments. So what we did, and it'll also help us in the future as we have a better understanding of our topic. Um, from the start, like personally, knowing about like in the beginning of the program, I didn't know much about it, but as the program progressed and at the end now, I'm like, I know much more about it. And I feel like to other people and in the future to other like researchers trying to find better like understanding about this, um, our work will definitely help. And I, as a cohort, I think I can speak behalf, uh, on, on the behalf of all of us, we've learned a lot more than we started with. Amazing, thank you. Any other responses to that question? Yeah, um, kind of going off of what Sherry was saying, I think kind of also similar to what Millen was saying before, teens, by learning like teaching the teens about these various problems that occur in society it's more of as if like teens can teach teens right instead of adults trying to teach teens it's like you know different lingo we we don't obviously learn as well as we do from we learn with our peers so I think learning more about like how we learned from this uh, amazing cohort we can kind of pass down what we learned to other people and kind of just spread that through society and and kind of voice this unheard problem around the world. Awesome, Pranav, thank you. Great, uh, appreciate all the questions that came in. Thank you to the Research Associates for your very thoughtful answer. And I'm gonna toss it back to Matt. Kelly, thank you very much, more importantly. Cohort, thank you very much. Uh, and just as importantly uh, to our participants and uh, attendees, thank you for those questions. One of my favorite things about this program, one of my favorite things about working with exceptional teens is they never cease to amaze me. The entire concept of the Teen Think Tank program is built on the fact that your goal in life or my goal in life, speaking for myself, is to never be the smartest person in the room. If you're the smartest person in the room, find another room. That's the Teen Think Tank project motto. And when I am with these cohorts, and this is not hyperbole, uh, this is not a sales pitch, this is not a, uh, 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 an over-exaggeration, is 10 times out of 10, I can stay in the room 
that I enter because I am never the smartest person. And these individuals are indeed um, the future, but more importantly, they are the present. And I love the opportunity to hear them speak. And I get to do that twice a week for 12 consecutive weeks. And I'm glad now that you have had the opportunity uh, to hear them speak because they are absolutely phenomenal. So uh, wherever you are right now, please give them a round of applause, an actual round of applause, and they will hear the spirit. They will hear the vibes. They certainly deserve it. But we are not done yet. We've got some business to take care of and to help us do that is research cohort member Jada Hendrickson. Thank you, Matt. So right now we are going to be presenting the Community Service Award. Even though all of our speakers contributed to where we stand as a cohort, as a group, we decided that Mazozi was our most influential speaker. Therefore, we will be making a $500 donation to the organization or foundation of her choice in the name of our research cohort. When Matt first announced that we would be nominating a speaker for this award, I automatically thought of Mazozi. She has truly contributed an unbelievable amount to this cohort. Her firsthand knowledge as a practitioner in this field was very insightful and alter my perspective in a way that I could not have imagined. From her presentation, she helped me as well as other members of the group conceptualize the practical side of poverty while confirming ideas that we grasp from our source texts. So thank you, Mazozi, for everything you have done. As you are here today, I can only hope that we make you proud in the ways that we decided to utilize the insight that you have given us. Now I would like to throw it to Leah to kind of give the backstory of this award. So for this Community Impact Award, we wanted to nominate a contributor, speaker, or instructor, instructor that had the most impact on us as a cohort and as a community. It was important to us to not only choose a contributor that is deserving of this award, but also to acknowledge that they touched our hearts, as cheesy as it sounds, in the best way possible. As agents of change, it was only right to nominate those who helped us become agents of change. Therefore, we chose Ms. Ozzy. Congratulations, Ms. Ozzy. Can I unmute? Is that okay to unmute? Or am I messing up the program? You're great, Ms. Ozzy. Okay. Go right ahead. I, I have been smiling and beaming throughout um, this presentation. I'm really, really proud to see all your fruition, um, uh, all your work come to fruition. And thank you again. I am very humbled and honored that you have selected me as your recipient. Um, so thank you very much. I can't thank you enough. But most of all, I'm very, very proud of your work. Um, is it possible for me to share my screen? Uh, yeah, it should be. Go right ahead. So I wanted to acknowledge um, Nate. Nate, are you still on the call? Oh, I'm here. I'm, I was muted. Sorry. Thank you. So um, I met Nate through um, one of our programs, Getting Ahead, and Nate has um, really utilized one of the resources we have, which is the Math Savings Program. So I'm just going to give her about five minutes so she can talk about that, and then I'll give you an overview of the work that we do, and then hand it back to um, the co-host. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you, Ms. Osley, for having me. Um, of course, you are amazing and you are well deserving of this word. So con congratulations. You, they have chosen the correct person for this. Um, I met her, like uh, she mentioned, through Get Ahead. And I was new to Pennsylvania in this surrounding area. And I was really in a state where I didn't know my next move. So I was able to take advantage of a program with United Ways. And with that, I was able to um, participate in Getting Ahead, which was amongst more other things than just the Match Savings Program, which I'm gonna talk about now. And with the Match Savings Program, I was able to learn how to re 
reconstruct myself with my finances, meaning learning how to budget accordingly to my means of living and also the value of money and how to reserve my money and put it in places where it's going to work for me. And it opened my mind to do not only more research, but also to have more discipline and how I treat myself dealing with money. And it's very important that you know how to deal with money. And with that program, I was able to accomplish that and I'm still succeeding with that today. The match program was able to match me to start my business, which is Studio Alum, which is a digital art um, illustrating company that I've been planning to do for a while. And I really didn't know how to get it started. And by taking the program, in a whole, I was able to just get my thoughts together. And there, there was a team of them there to help us. Every class was a step towards this business is all I can say. It was, um, I like to call it an investment, right? The mass saving program to me was an investment in my dreams. And I'm just really grateful that I was able to learn so much about my finances, about how I deal with money, how I view money, and how I see myself in money. And I, and I keep saying that because people, a lot of times people just spend money, but they don't know where money is going. They don't know how to um, obtain revenue. It's just so many layers to it. And when you're younger, that's something that um, you think you're going to learn during life, but I am 40 and I'm telling you, I really picked it up in that particular class. And by that, I was able to gain some self-control over myself and dealing with my finances and um, able to start my own business and um, be successful at that. So I'm just really grateful about it. And the match saving program if, if I can say anything else about it, it um, matches you whatever you save up to um, $1,500, $1, right? So it matched me $1,500. And at first I thought it was going to be easy to save $1,500, but I, I started to see my pattern of spending. The more I was spending, the less I was investing in myself. So I said, these people have invested $1,500 in me, how fast can I invest $1,500 in myself? So not only did I save the $1,500, I saved an extra $1,000 on top of that that was able to help me get the rest of my equipment, like my computer, my iPad Pro, and everything else to start creating. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Nate. All right, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what it is that we do here at United Way, and hopefully you'll be able to just get a glimpse into what it is that we do. Um, so I like to just talk about, um, we can't be United Way without a community. So definitely, um, we're, the work that we do is made possible by community support. Um, also, we have a vision of where everyone in our community has ample opportunities for quality education, health, and financial stability. Our mission that we strive to achieve every day is where we engage and mobilize resources in order to advance and accelerate community change. And there are many ways we can do this. It could be collaborations with other agencies, um, outreach to other um, like-minded individuals who are focusing on the same thing, and also through advocacy. Through advocacy and just what we're um, advocating for on the local, state, and federal level, we're able to connect with others and then also support our community members. Before COVID-19, the impact of poverty and social um, injustice was great. Already people in our community were suffering and um, COVID just accelerated that. A lot of families in Monroe County are one emergency away from poverty. And that could mean just being late on your rent, being late on your bill or something like that. And we saw that um, just from the calls that we were getting through our helpline, a lot of people were um, pushed further into poverty. So any gift to Pokemon's United Way helps our neighbors get back on their feet by providing these supports. I'm not sure you'll be able to see this um, great, but I'm happy to share this with Matt and then he can share it with you all. Any dollar donation yields a seven, up to $7.53 in impact. 
So we leverage this through um, federal dollars, and state laws that we're able to bring into our community. This report is also gonna be available on our website, I think in a couple of weeks, fingers crossed. And then you'll be able to see that as well. Some of the programming that we do provide, our main thing um, is advocacy, advocacy at all levels. We also currently have the Emer Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which is through the CARES Act, where we provide um, up to 12 months back, and, back rent and utility support for Monroe County residents. We also have eviction mediation. A lot of the issues that people get evicted for is just something simple. And then um, we have a very skilled um, staff member who manages eviction mediation. She um, brokers conversations between landlords and tenants. And sometimes it's as simple as sitting down and hearing the other side and then um, finding some common ground. Our information on referral helpline provides information on everything in Monroe County. It could be where can I get a backpack for my kids? Where can I um, find a, an eye doctor that would take this kind of insurance? We also provide developmental screenings to all of um, all children from age um, birth to five, where we just check their hearing, check their vision, check their um, the speech also, just to make sure that they'll be ready and have a successful start in kindergarten. We provide prescription savings where um, anyone in the county is able to get some savings on a prescription. And this also helps a lot of families um, financial stability because medication and just actual healthcare impacts a lot of families. And then sometimes could be at um, breaking points between um, having a roof over your head today or not having a roof over your head tomorrow. Cultural awareness is also one thing. Uh, we also provide a double box program where SNAP recipients are able to double their food dollars. So for example, if someone has $20 on their SNAP card at the farmer's market, they'll be able to get um, $40 worth of fruits and vegetables. In-home mentoring is also part of our education initiatives where we provide support to early childhood um, families, especially at-risk families, providing the resources to be parenting and make sure that they're um, making, supporting their children and thriving. Pre-K to 12 scholarships for any eligible income family if you're in Monroe County, where they sometimes, I'm not sure how it is because we're all over the United States, but pretty much your school is, the choice of school is limited to where you are in the district. And with these scholarships, we're able to make sure that children have access to quality education in our community. One major thing that helps with financial stability is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. We um, provide free tax filing services to anyone who makes up to $66,000 per individual. And we were able to bring, last year we were able to bring over $250,000 back into our community in refunds. Literacy resources, free resources include the Getting Ready for Kindergarten calendar. It provides um, a day-to-day -day, um, guidelines for families to engage with their children to promote, to promote um, reading, early learning, and just building those skills that they need in life. So I already talked about um, the circle of support made possible through our community um, partners. And also we have a united approach to community challenges. So we've been in this business for, se business for 75 years and we've met, managed to maintain a long-standing relationship with our um, partners and also addressing injustices at many levels, including um, serving our community and also our community partners. So I like this, we used this last year and I just like being united starts with you, right? And I've already seen this in your presentations today talking about how you've been able to do your research and bring in all this um, information and presenting, and also just having that mind to what people didn't think about um, regarding financial stability before. So um, I'm gonna end with this. Thank you again for making our community strong and thank you for the opportunity to present to your cohort. Sosie, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you taking the time. I appreciate the information and most importantly, I appreciate the support. Um, and, and I know you've had a profound impact on the group, so much so um, while we were planning this research launch party, um, it became apparent we had a, a schedule to fill out. We had some information that we were going to convey. And I opened up the suggestion to the group that we simply use this time to flex our muscles, to show off to let everybody know how awesome we are. Because I'm a Gen Xer, and that is exactly what Gen Xers do. And they said, that's, that's okay, Matt, nice thought, but here's what we are actually going to do. 
we're going to call Masozi and we are going to ask her to come and speak. And we're going to see if she would bring a colleague of hers to talk about the benefits of the United Way programming, the struggles that real live individuals have living uh, in poverty and living with financial instability, because we think that what we are doing is real work. This isn't a vanity project. This is not our opportunity to just show people that we did a summer project. We're in this for the real, and we are in this for change. So, Matt, let's make sure we spend some time in this presentation showing the people who attend what reality is, because that's our job as change agents. And that is why we're here. And I commend them for it. And Masozi uh, and Nate, I thank you for, for supporting them and, and, and helping them make a change. One of the ways we like to recognize our students who are all exceptional, high achieving high school students um, is through a quantifiable recognition. And the most obvious recognition for high school students is a scholarship award. And when we started this program, we wanted to provide those students who showed an interest in society as a large, uh, society as large, the ability to realize benefit, not only personal benefit, not only material benefit, but monetary benefit, because we want them to realize that being a change agent is not only a hobby and should not be looked at as an extracurricular activity, but it should be looked at as a profession, as a career, as a way to make a living. Now, as change agents like Masozi, myself, and Kelly know it is a meager and humbling living that we make dedicating ourselves to social change, but we want to, to make sure that these young change agents are recognized for their work. Therefore, we developed the Teen Think Tank Project Scholarship. This cohort is the beneficiary of Perennis Financial Planning's generous contribution. And to talk a little bit about her experience with these students and announce the uh, winner of the Teen Think Tank Project's Re Summer Research Cohort Scholarship Award um, is my good friend, Mary Pascarella from Fina uh, Perennis Financial Planning. Mary, how are you? I'm doing great, Matt. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with everyone. So the reason I asked Mary to come and present this award is because if it was up to me to present this award, we would have to give out 11 scholarships. And while someday I hope that to be the reality of the Teen Think Tank project, um, we currently only have the means to award one of these exceptional students um, a $500 cash scholarship, and that is made possible um, by Mary and, and the folks at Perennis Financial Planning. So, uh, Mary, would you come up with? Uh, well, it is uh, my honor to be able to uh, announce the winner, but I have to say uh, I received eight amazing essays uh, from the cohort participants. Uh, narrowed down to three uh, essays that were very impressive. Uh, oh, everyone is impressive. I mean, I from the invitation I had when I we did the one meeting together um, to getting to know some of these students one on one. Uh, I have just to, to echo Kelly's uh, sentiment as far as giving me hope for the future. You know, this is it. They say you know it, it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and I think. This teen think tank is really the spark uh, for so many young people to give them the incentive and the know-how and the tools to really make the ultimate difference in 
their future and my future and, and, and the world, you know, as a whole. So it is my honor to announce that the winner of uh, the scholarship is Jada Hendrickson. Wow, thank you so much, Mary. I'm almost at a loss for words. Um, first and foremost, I just wanna thank all of the cohort members. I don't think you guys will ever understand how much inspiration and confidence I gained from just being surrounded by you guys. I've never had the chance to be around such ambitious and driven teenagers like you 10. It's really been one of the most legendary summers of my life. Of course, I wanna thank Matt and Kelly. You guys are some of the coolest adults that I know. To have a passion to give teens a voice in a world run by mostly disconnected adults is so admir admirable. I can never thank both of you enough for the opportunities that both of you have provided me. Also, an additional thanks to Kelly for always being willing to talk about international conflicts with me. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to thank all of our guest speakers, specifically Mary, who funded the scholarship. It was so fun to be able to explain to you my why. It was also amazing to talk to someone who I related to so much. The tips you gave me during our, conversa during our conversation will be remembered for a lifetime. So I thank each one of you, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Jada, thank you very much. You certainly deserve the award and, and have earned the award. Um, and I echo your sentiments, all of your cohort uh, research associate colleagues uh, are, are outstanding individuals. And, and I think you summed it up uh, perfectly. And um, Kelly, for the record, I would just like it noted that while you did make yourself available for chats about international conflicts, um, Jada said I was cool. So I think at worst, that's a tie. But in my book, um, that's a win. So thank you very much, Jada. I, I was it. totally going to work that into my next comments. And Matt, did you hear that? We're cool. We've been <laughs> looking, well, you more specifically, but we've been looking for validation of that for probably the last 18 months. And like, I feel like we can retire now. Jada just gave us like the best gift ever. Um, well, let, let's talk about what is next. And let's talk a little bit about the Teen Think Tank project from a global perspective. Let's take a step back from, from the great work the cohort has done. And, and let's tell these folks how we can foster more Jadas, more Fionas, more Leas, more research cohort associates through the Teen Think Tank project. Yeah, definitely. We have amazing, we have an amazing community of people who are motivated to elevate the voices of teens and help them become the future leaders we need to create a more cooperative and sustainable community. And the support we've received from this community over the past year as we've brought the vision of the Teen Think Tank project to life has really been overwhelming. When Matt and I put our heads together to create the Teen Think Tank project over a year ago, we thought we had a good idea. We thought we were cool, but we weren't really sure if others would jump on board. We, at the time, we were both feeling very disheartened by the trajectory of our society but we didn't feel that hope for change lied with our peers. We were noticing that they were really stuck in their partisan lanes and not open to change or having open-minded conversations. So we needed another approach. And just as Matt said, our motto is, if you're the smartest person in the room, find another room. So we kept changing rooms and eventually we found ourselves in a high school classroom with students who were yearning to join the conversation about issues that affect them in their communities but the problem was no one was listening to them. Uh, so we set out to change that. And at the same time, try to create more equitable, cooperative and sustainable society. And to our excitement, so many people did join us in this vision that we could create a better society for everyone by empowering students to become agents of change, by fostering their social and emotional skills that will help them become effective leaders and members of society. And our community continues to grow. And because of that, it's helping us reach more and more teens. And the 11 agents of change you saw tonight were beneficiaries of the generosity of the socially conscious community. And this community is actively bringing our vision to life. And as I said before, 
I have so much more faith in the future of our society after seeing what these students are capable of. And so our goal is to continue growing both our community and our programming. And I'm excited to say it, it's happening. Uh, we've actually expanded to schools so we can reach a larger group of students. Um, and today's a momentous day because we actually graduated another cohort of students this afternoon from a school-based program in New York State. And that was actually why Matt referenced that he's heard the same Supreme Court case referenced twice in one day. I mean, we live in a world where teenagers are referencing Supreme Court cases and I get to hear from two totally different groups about the same Supreme Court case. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a political scientist junkie and I'm a nerd, so that really excites me. You might not share my excitement, but the gravity of two separate groups of students understanding significant laws in our, our society is, is amazing. Uh, We've expanded our opportunities for students by growing a new content creation team, uh, which is another great way to give teens a voice. And I, I, we're humbled uh, by the fact that as we grow, so many people have inquired about how they can join this community and help develop teens into strong, effective leaders. So I wanna take uh, the next few minutes to share some of these opportunities with you. Um, if they speak to you, amazing. Um, or maybe you can pass them along to others who feel really called to do something to create a, a more equitable and sustainable society. Um, so our newest opportunity is the Ambassador Affiliate, Ambassador Affiliate Program. The program gives supporters an opportunity to connect more teens with our programming while also earning some extra income. So for every student who enrolls in a cohort, thanks to one of our ambassadors referrals, that ambassador earns money. Kind of fitting that we're talking about financial stability one way we're helping to carry that out uh, there's no limit to the number of students ambassadors can refer or how much money they can earn and ambassadors who apply and are accepted into the program prior to september 1st uh, will receive a preferred commission for referrals who enroll before the end of the year um, so matt's being awesome and putting these links into the chat um, if you want to click on them and explore, it'll take you to our webpage. You can get more information and fill out the application. Uh, don't worry, you don't need to have sales experience to be an ambassador. All you need is passion for our mission and a willingness to talk to your friends, families, neighbors, online communities, et cetera. Um, again, ambassadors who apply and are accepted into the program prior to September 1st uh, will uh, get preferred commission on the referrals who enroll in an upcoming cohort. Uh, the second way we offer friends of the Teen Think Tank project an opportunity to help us give teens a voice is with our Pay It Forward program. So we never want finances to be a barrier for a socially conscious student who wants to join a research cohort. So to make sure we're inclusive of all inspiring agents of change, we're growing our scholarship funds thanks to the generosity of people who contribute to the Pay It Forward program. Um, so if you've been impressed by tonight's presentation or aspire to create a better society for everyone or want to support motivated students, uh, please consider contributing to the Pay It Forward program. We'd be very appreciative and you'll be helping to develop our future leaders. A third way we're growing our community is helping to connect advocates and agents of change across the country through our virtual platforms. So you can follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. You can subscribe to our YouTube page and if you visit our website, which is teenthinktankproject.com, you can sign up to receive our emails. But don't worry, we'd all rather be fighting for social justice and working with teens and writing emails. So I promise you, we will not overload your inbox. Um, but through our virtual community, we'll keep you updated on our students' work and the Teen Think Tank Project. Um, so we'd love to have you as a part of our community in any way that feels comfortable and exciting to you. Um, for any students that are joining us this evening, we have upcoming cohorts starting um, towards the end of September. Um, information on those offerings, there are four different topics, um, are also available on our website. And Matt and I are always happy to talk to aspiring agents of change. Right on the website, you can register for a 30-minute conversation with us, no charge to explore the program, um, and share with us 
uh, what you're hoping to do to create a, a better society. Um, so thank you all in advance for helping to create the agents of change who are going to lead us into the future. And again, deepest thanks um, for all to all of you for being with us tonight and supporting these 11 amazing future agents of change. Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, one of the most uh, influential voices that uh, connected with us early on was was a a noted uh, social justice advocate, um, Dr. Richard Lapchick, whose story is amazing, uh, especially with his work in racial inequality, and and he told us early on that there is no excuse. You don't have to be on the front lines, but you have to get off the sidelines. And if that means, if that means for you getting out uh, to a protest or to a homeless shelter or to an organization to donate your time, by all means, do it. If you can't do that, donate money for people who can do that. If you can't afford to do that, send your spirits and vibes but just know that that only goes so far. And I, I realize for, for some folks who, for some folks who were here and, and, and taking in all that these students had to offer, we got to the part where it's kind of like, we're trying to sell you a timeshare on your honeymoon in Italy. But um, trust us, this work that we are doing um, is is meaningful and it's impactful and and we are simply providing a, a platform and a voice for these teens. They're doing all the work. We just want to make sure that we are able um, to support them. And uh, with that, I, I, I'm looking out uh, amongst the attendees and I'm seeing um, all of those individuals who who help. Uh, Brad Story. Uh, I saw Donna Gallup, I saw Connie Whitman, I saw Mary Pascarella, Masozi Houston, obviously, Nate Harris, thank you very much. All those individuals um, stand by us and do our work uh, as we do our work or help the teens do uh, the bulk of the work. And, and I'm also seeing um, family. I'm seeing, I'm seeing the Lou's. I'm seeing uh, the Shanahan's. I'm seeing the Desai's and, and any other family members that I'm missing. Um, thank you for your support. You have amazing children, amazing family members, um, and you don't mind if they are on a conference call at 2 a.m. while your family uh, is vacationing and moving your oldest child into a college in Amsterdam. That's the kind of support that these students need, um, and every single one of them appreciates it, um, as do Kelly and I. So um, thank you to all of those folks. But most importantly, um, as we wrap up, I'd like to thank the cohort individually, each of you, Pranav, Ashwarya, Fiona, Indiana, Jada, Leah, Millen, Salma, Samir, Shrey, Zachary. Kelly, thank you very much for helping me help these students navigate um, this journey over the last 12 weeks. They could have been doing anything else. And by that, I mean anything else, but they chose uh, to spend it here making a change uh, and they all should be applauded. So with that said, I will hand it back over to them to give final words and closing remarks on these proceedings, which will end the summer research cohort season. Thank you, Matt. So before we conclude the summer 2021 launch party, we wanted to recognize the biggest contributors to our project. By the way, they don't even know about this. So this is kind of a surprise. You heard them through this presentation talk about the wonderful things this program provides, but they forgot one important thing the impact that they had on us. So without further ado, everyone give a silent round of applause to Matt and Kelly. I think I'm speaking on behalf of the cohort. Honestly, without you guys, we couldn't have done any of this. You guys gave us the voice and confidence we needed in order to see change occur. So thank you. And I guess you guys are kind of cool. With that, we conclude our summer 2021 launch party. 
Thank, thank you for everyone coming out and supporting us. And keep tuned to see what these amazing teens plan to do in the future and see the change that we need in society. Thank you.